meeting for Rapid City, South Dakota for the July or January 4th, 2010 meeting. Wishful thinking is warmer in July. First thing as always is a roll call and determination of the quorum. Amber, if you would, please. Wah? Here. Martinson? Here. Quaker? Here. Costello? Here. LaCroix? Here. Chapman? Happy New Year. Olson? Here. Weifenbach? Here. Kroger? Here. Hadcock? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Just a reminder, we are still working on the audio and video. Uh, just a reminder that the mics may or may not be on, so don't trust the little light in front of you. Just assume it's on all the time. We do not have a queuing as of yet. They'll be in tomorrow or the next day to actually get our queuing up, so we're back to raising our hands. Uh, so there again, if uh, I will try and look up and down the dais as best I can, but if I miss you, please just uh, speak up. Appreciate it. Next thing is always the, is the invocation. A reminder before we get into the invocation, if you have a cell phone or a pager, if you please turn that off or put it to the vibrate mode, we'd certainly appreciate that. Also, if you wish to speak to any item on the agenda tonight, we do have speaker request forms. They're to your left, my right over on the media table. If you please fill that out with your name, your address, and also the item number that you'd like to speak to, as that way as we make our way down the agenda, we will not overlook you. With that, I would ask everyone to please rise for invocation. Our invocation tonight is given by Steve uh, Selfridge of the First Wesleyan Church. And then please remain standing, and the Boy Scout Troop 1187 will lead us in the pledge. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today. Thank you for this day of January 4, 2010, for a new year on our calendar anyway. And I thank you for the things that are going to be decided even tonight. And I ask, Lord Jesus, that, that you would provide wisdom and direction, vision, hope, encouragement for those who are making decisions. Um, sometimes the decisions can be difficult and, and uh, not knowing which way to go. And so, Lord, I pray that you would provide the wisdom that is needed. I thank you for the individuals who help rule over our city. Thank you for our mayor and our city council. Thank you for the uh, positions of authority and leadership that they have. And I pray that, that you would guard their hearts and, and that you would guard their minds as they try to lead our city forward. I ask, Heavenly Father, that uh, in everything that happens in this meeting tonight, I'd give you glory and honor. And Lord, I, I, I want to pray sp specifically for each council man and councilwoman and our mayor. I know they have families that uh, are they're not with right now, and, and there may be some urgent needs right now. And I just pray that you would put a hedge of protection around each of those and that you would provide for each family member as, as their family member here sits and, and serves our community. And I thank you for that. I ask that you would continue to provide your hand for our city. May it go forward, and may it protect and lead each citizen in the way that you deem, deem efficient and most productive. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone, and that was Boy Scout Troop 1187. Thank you for coming this evening. Next on the agenda, as always, is the adoption of the agenda. Do we have any additional items that we need to add to the agenda that is, that is not currently on? If so, please raise your hand. Mr. Preston. Thank you, Mayor. Item number 39 is on the consent calendar. We'll actually, okay. Can we take that we, now? Or? No, we'll, we'll actually pull that. Jason's, where'd Jason go? We can just pull that and deal with that, can't we? I'm sorry? Go ahead, Joel. Okay, Mr. Mr. Preston, go ahead and read the title line, if you would. This is, we're dealing with item number 39. Thank you, Mayor. 
Uh, there was a handout that was put in your box. You may or may not have it, but this, uh, there, there was a duplication of 38 and 39. What 39 should really read is recommend carrying forward $112,800 into to the year 2010 for Memorial Park North Irrigation to allow staff to be begin design for the project. Okay, very good. We'll go ahead and plan on dealing. We'll pull that off the consent calendar to make sure we're in good shape. Any additional items that need to be placed on tonight's agenda that is not currently posted? Joel? Thank you, Mayor. I'd ask to add an item 70 and 71 after the executive session. Item 70 will be canceling the January 11th special council meeting, and item 71 will be uh, re adding an item resetting the public hearing on the downtown business improvement district. Okay, very good. We will call that item number 70 and 71, and we'll do that after the executive session, correct? Okay, any additional items being added to the agenda? Okay, what, just, so, just so you know, we will actually uh, get to that just very shortly. There is a period called general public comment periods, and that will be coming up in about two or three minutes here. Okay, thank you. Any additional items be placed on the agenda? Any additional items? If not, the chair will look for a motion to approve the agenda as amended, please. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. That does take us to the approval of the minutes. Chair would look for a motion to approve the minutes for the December 21st, 2009 regular council meeting and the December 29th, 2009 special council meeting. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. That does take us to awards and recognitions. We do have one, and I would ask uh, Alderman Chapman to come join me up front. we go. We're going to surprise Alderman Chapman here. He doesn't know what this is. This was given to me by Senator Craig Teason, and this was a recognition by the South Dakota State Senate. And let me just read where it says, whereas Malcolm Chapman is an outstanding city council member who is not only an asset to a city but to all municipalities in the state of South Dakota, and whereas Malcolm Chapman is a strong advocate for South Dakota, providing an example of leadership, commitment, volunteerism, and giving back to one's community, and whereas Malcolm's activities with our municipality has expanded to services to all cities in the United States, and he was elected to the Board of Directors for the National League of Cities, and whereas Malcolm's calm professionalism has helped his council focus on the tasks that need to be awarded or be accomplished, now therefore be it acknowledged that the 84th legislature of the state of South Dakota does hereby proclaim Malcolm Chapman uh, in his recognition of the Excellence in Municipal Government Award for 2008. Congratulations. The mayor surprised me, and uh, I've never been speechless, but I'm speechless. So thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. No Malcolm Chapman Day? <laughs> Thank you, and that was a surprise to Malcolm because I didn't give anybody heads up, and that is quite the award uh, for all elected officials in the state of South Dakota. Malcolm was recognized for his efforts through the South Dakota Municipal League, and he is also very active in the National uh, League of Cities, so we thank him for all the service. With that, now we go on to the general public comment period. This is a time for members of the public to discuss or express concerns to the council on any issue not on the agenda tonight. Actions will not be taken at the meeting tonight on any issue not on the agenda except by placement on the agenda by the unanimous vote of the council members present. Is there anyone from the audience who would like to talk about any issue not on the agenda? 
Now, just a reminder, this is a period where we do time. You'll have three minutes. So what I'll do is I'll ask you to come up, give us your name, and then the floor will be yours. Very good. And if, did you have something? To, oh, if you want to go to the dais, right there. And Herman, if you would uh, take a look up here, you'll see the green lights. Uh, you'll have three minutes, and when that turns uh, yellow, if you just start winding up your remarks. Uh, before I begin, can I hand out some photographs? Ab absolutely. If you want to hand them, hand them to the end of the dais here, and we'll okay. pass those down for you. Okay, and if you'd identify yourself for the record, and the floor is yours. Okay, my name is Herman Roberts, and I live at 123 East Anamosa Street. This is concerning disrespectful snow plowing on East Anamosa Street. Snow plowed by the city reaches eight feet from my curb, reaching out into the traffic lane. The city is breaking a federal law by not allowing my mail to be delivered. All of my neighbors have the same problem. Year after year, I always get a very much larger amount of snow plowed and pushed into my lower driveway compared to everyone else on my street. I now have come to a point where the only reason this is being done is because of my color of my skin. I have a medical condition, high blood pressure. Having to dig and shovel these excessively large amounts of snow can be very dangerous, if not fatal. Because of this disrespectful act by the city snow plows, I lost a total of three days from work just to dig out, not to mention not feeling very well from excessive digging and shoveling. City snow plows race up and down the street when plowing. There are other areas to place or put the snow instead of the residential side of the street. I would like to thank our mayor, as this is the second year in a row I have talked with him, and he has always been there for me and helped out with a very quick time response. It was not until this morning, January 4th, 2012, that my mailbox was made accessible by the city plows. The only problem is they only did mine and left my neighbor's mailboxes still snowed in. If East Anamosa Street between Maple Avenue and Herman Street were plowed with respect and responsibility, my neighbors and myself would not have half the problems we have now. My neighbor, Dan Ager, wanted to be here also but couldn't as he had to work. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate you coming down. And the uh, photos do I passed out. Can I have copies of those, if that's okay, prior to me leaving? We'll actually pass those all the way down, and uh, you can certainly get those back. Okay. Thank you for coming down and sharing. Okay. Any additional public concerns? Any other issues that anyone from the public would like to bring up that is not on the agenda tonight? Any additional items? Seeing none, we will move forward. We're on to the non-public hearing items. This is items one through 62, one through 62. Chair will look for a motion to open the public comment period on item one through 48, please. So moved. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, motion passes. Let's see, if we got any. I do not have any speaker request forms on any items one through 48 inclusive. Anyone from the audience wish to speak to any item one through 48, one through 48. If not, the chair will look for a motion to close the public comment period. We have a motion and second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. We are to the consent calendar. This is items one through 46 inclusive. Chair would ask if any items one through 46 inclusive need to be pulled from the consent calendar. I have items 31 and 39. Any additional items that need to be pulled from the consent calendar? Any additional items? If not, the chair will look for a motion to approve the consent calendar. This is items one through 46 inclusive with the exception of item 31 and 39. So we have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. We are on to legal and finance 
I'm sorry, Mr. Chapman, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I know that um, the council doesn't routinely make comments in terms of what's um, said during general public comment, but just in light of here we have all these scouts sitting here who heard a citizen in our community come forward with some sort of um, ask or complaint, and it seems as if we just dismissed it. Uh, and we didn't, but I think some explanation of uh, at least the process that we go through would be helpful for them, especially as they're learning about citizenship and good government and all. I think that would just be helpful. Yep, very good. We're on item number 31. Item 31. Ian, did you want me to go ahead and explain? Why don't we do this? Typically, uh, we have a, a set agenda per state statute. We actually have a specific format that we need to, to follow. At the beginning of every, every city council meeting, we give the opportunity for anyone from the public to come forward with any concerns that they have that is not on the agenda. Now, typically what will happen is if there is a concern, we don't take it up that night because of the fact that we don't have, in most cases, any background information, but the council certainly has that ability to talk about it in the future, and typically that would be placed on the agenda either at legal and finance at public works and then make its way back to the city council two weeks from tonight. So that's typically the process. Okay. With that, let's go to item 31, and that is a legal and finance item. So, Alderwoman, Alderwoman uh, Karen Gunderson Olson, could you please read an item number 31, please? Thank you very much. Confirm the appointment. Nope. Excuse me. Request the confirmation. Um, request that the confirmation request for new board members from the mayor's office include a list of the current board members with their expiration dates. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? And the reason I asked that to be pulled was I just wanted to point out that everyone from the council should have received an email with all of the, all the, uh, the entire database of all the appointments. We will be posting that online, and we will also try and give you a list every time we bring forward a new appointment. So with that, we'll go to Alderwoman Deb Hatcock. I appreciate that, Mayor. That was just easier when we're doing um, some of our appointments that we know who's coming up and uh, if citizens call us, we can also explain some of the process in which we do things. Thank you, Mayor, for doing that. Absolutely, and I think it's also very important we actually put it on the website. That way anyone from the public can actually look at any one of our committees and see who actually serves. Uh, typically in these cases, these are voluntary positions, but see who are serving on the numerous uh, different boards that we have here at the city. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item number 39, if you would, Karen. Do you have the new language? Um, there should be a separate sheet. I'm not sure if I do. Is this the, does the language include 112, 800? Yep. Yes. I, I do have that. You do have that. Yep. The motion would be to um, pass to recommend carrying forward $112,800 into the 2012 for Memorial Park North irrigation to allow staff to begin design for that project. My motion is for approval. We have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Thank you, everyone. That does take us to the end of the consent calendar. We are on to the continued consent items. This is items 47 and 48. I'll go to Marsha. Do we need to pull either one of those? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Chair, we'll look for a seat. Anyone from the council need to pull either 47 or 48 from the continued consent calendar? If not, the chair will look for a motion to approve the continued consent calendar items 47 and 48. We have a motion and a second to continue both these items per the recommendation uh, to January 19, 2010. Any discussion on that motion? In discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, everyone. That does take us to the end of the, of the continued consent items. We are on to the non-consent items. This is items 49 through 62 inclusive. 49 through 62 inclusive. Chair would look for a motion to open the public comment period for items 49 through 62. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Let's see here. We do have a couple of speaker request forms. Thank you, 
On item number 51, Ken Abel. Item number 51. Very good, Ken, if you come forward and identify yourself and you'll have your three minutes. My name's Ken Udell, I'm from the uh, 20 Anaconda. Uh, I come here, I oppose the uh, no feeding ban for the reason the citizens didn't create it and the corrective action of not feeding them won't fix it. Uh, the problem goes back eight or 10 years with the drought, mild winters, and, and open water at Canyon Lake. Uh, and the rains have just expanded. We have got more migratory birds in our area than we ever had before. We never had nesting Canadian geese at Sheridan Lake, Pactola, there in every lake in the hills. So what you got, overpopulation, has naturally happened. Uh, the reason why the feeding ban won't do any good, not that it would hurt, but what I'm saying is the geese, they eat grass. They love grass. They love open areas, and Canyon Lake is perfect. Uh, the, uh, if you went out there this summer, you'd notice that the island out there, the grass is down to the nubbins. They eat all the grass. They haven't mowed that island in two years. The lake, you don't see any, any weeds. We have a weed cutting machine. They haven't cut the weeds in six years. The geese keep that crop down. In fact, they've eaten the ducks out of a house and home because they've got shorter necks. The, the ducks, they like the crick. You see them on a crick, but you don't see the geese. They like open areas. They like open grassy areas. They like open water. We have year-round open water. Thanks to just upstream, we have a 52-degree warm water discharge. It keeps the lake open. We've got everything that's perfect for the Canadian geese that are there. Canadian geese are the problem, and they love to warm sidewalks. The North Shore over there is naturally attractive uh, to wildlife because of the, the sun's rays and the warming that the North Shore gets versus the South Shore. The concrete, they love the concrete ramps. They love boat ramps. They love fishing piers. They just love that stuff. That's where they spend their nights. That's where they make their messes. But what, what people are feeding them isn't going to make any difference. They eat grass. And if they don't have enough grass here, they got transportation. They'll go out and eat off the agricultural people. Uh, so I don't know how much they're feeding that people are doing. I haven't heard of any study or any reference as to what's the impact of what they're feeding. First time we've got past ordinance without having any really data. We have things that we can do that we haven't tried yet. Uh, you can use the bypass. Uh, bypass some of that warm water. There's talk of strobe lights. We could drain the, the, the lagoons. We could do landscaping. We can do all these things without having any input from any other officials that's putting the hammer on us saying we got to have a feeding ordinance. And if I could just ask you to just wrap up your comments. Okay. Trying to do this in three minutes is a little tough. <laughs> I guess those are my comments. Those are some of the things I think maybe we ought to try before we pass the feeding ordinance. If, any questions? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's go to Bob Brandt, item number 56. Oh, there's a cell phone. You know what the rule is, if your cell phone goes off, you're buying everybody donuts tomorrow. Bagels. bagels. Okay, so someone who likes bagels, point out whose cell phone went off. <laughs> Go ahead, Bob. You Thank you, floor. Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, the owners of this property, Don and uh, Mike Wiesler, were forced into the replatting uh, of this planned commercial development by a dispute with a minor partner in the on-the-border property. Uh, but that should uh, come to an end with a court trial later this month. Uh, the PCD designation of this property assures that the future development of the other two lots will be very controlled. Right now, the only businesses that can be built there are two full-service restaurants. Any changes to that plan must be approved by a, a major amendment to the PCD, approved by the Planning Commission, and that would result in a review of the water and, service, water and sewer service lines. The lines were built to engineer specs. They were approved by the city's growth management department, 
and are adequately sized to service the three restaurants. Um, the main point to remember in this appeal is that, the requ uh, is that it will never cost the taxpayers one penny. The owners have signed the uh, covenant agreement prepared by the city attorneys. According to this covenant agreement, any maintenance or repairs to these lines will be the owner's responsibility. That includes any cleaning. If a fire hydrant seal goes bad, the owners are responsible for it, not the city. Um, the owners are s certainly not doing this to try to, we didn't build it with the, with the plan commercial development with this sewer line to try to get out of, of save, you know, out of any responsibility to build it to according to the city specs in the first place. In fact, the service road that we have to put in now costs the owners over $70,000 to get this replatted. Um, so I'd certainly appreciate your vote on this appeal and, and on the plat when it comes before you in two weeks after the Planning Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Ken. Is it first? Item number 58, 307 Stumer. Ken, did I get it right? Am I close? First, okay, very good. Ken, the floor is yours. If you, there again, please identify yourself for the record. Ken, first. I'm here after a meeting at the Public Works, um, 122909. Uh, contacted Brad Sloan, head of residential contractor board, to discuss putting on the agenda the issue of variances, setbacks, etc. Brad had informed me someone from the Public Works had already contacted him of the issue and that it would be put on the agenda at the next meeting. I asked if I could bring engineering firm and survey people to help speak to this issue. I have lined up Jerry with Angle Survey as well as SeaTech uh, Engineering Services, Inc. <coughs> Mike Riker, that works for him, to come to the next contractor board meeting to discuss these issues as well as to try to find a cost-effective solution and get their input on these issues. They both agreed to be at the next meeting on the 14th of January, 7.30. And this goes back to the zoning of the lots that I'm here for tonight. And I'll be here if you got any more questions. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Thank Thanks. you. Next, we also have a speaker request form from Ronald Bings. Uh, 3421 West Main on item number 58 also. Ron, if you there again, identify yourself for the record. Yes, Mayor. Ron Bangs with Advanced Engineering. I'm representing Ken First that just spoke for K1 Construction. Um, I'm speaking in favor of item 58 tonight. I want to provide the council a little bit brief background information on that item before you take it up later on the agenda. Um, the house was entirely built. We had, we had some very good discussion at the public works meeting on 1229, um, and some information that came out of there that um, I think is important for the council to be aware of. The house at the, was completely constructed at the time this issue was discovered. The easement issue was discovered following a location survey that Ken, K1 Construction, had uh, um, requested for the sale of the lot. And as soon as Ken realized that there was a problem that his survey uh, company had found with the uh, <clears throat> easement on that lot, he, he uh, contacted Brad with the city and brought that to the city's attention. Ken then did obtain a temp er, temporary CO after identifying this issue so he could move the sale of the house forward, but that temporary CO in no way guaranteed approval of the action uh, item on the agenda tonight. The problem stemmed from setting of two houses. The foundations were located from uh, a property, a rear property pin. And I, I believe it's linked on your agenda. The rear property pins were offset, so you had lots that came in not to a central single point, but multiple points. Uh, some landscaping had been done on one of the rear lots, and uh, K1 inadvertently located the incorrect property pin and measured a foundation location for two lots from that pin. One of those easement vacations was acted on a couple of months ago. This lot was not identified at that point until the sale of the lot. So thus we're back tonight with a second request on an adjacent lot. How do we avoid this problem? I know there's been a lot of frustration with the council on contractors not following plans. Um, and you've got, I think, one item on your agenda tonight dealing with the driveway. Um, 
Ken, as Ken has indicated, he sits on the contractor's board. He has taken the initiative to bring this before the contractor's board with an engineering firm and a surveying company um, other than myself to take a look at this and how he can avoid, how, how as a community we can avoid repeating this error in the future. He's also looking at more thorough verification of corners and verifying that against the plat document. Um, and, and with that presentation at the contractor's board, I believe you'll see some recommendations come back through the Public Works Committee. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you. At this point, we'll go on to item number 62, and we have a number of speaker request forms. The first one is Patricia Pummel. Dealing with item 62, and just for the audience, just you know, this is actually a public comment period, and once this is, is finished, then we will actually take these issues up one by one, and if council members do have any questions of anyone that uh, had any comments, that's the point where there will actually be discussion back and forth. With that, Patricia, if you'd identify yourself for the record. Yes, sir, may I ask a favor? My name is Patricia Pummel. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Deborah Jensen. She's also on your list of individuals to speak tonight. She's giving the overview of what we're speaking about tonight. Is that all right if she goes first? Tell you what, let's let Deb go first, and then you're going to go second. That would and we'll be fine. Right, we'll go through the Excellent. rest of them in order. So, Deb, if sure. you would, please. There again, Deb, if you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Deborah Jensen, and I'm president of the Mount Rushmore Row Group. It's an organization that has consisted of business owners, property owners, and residents along Mount Rushmore Road and nearby neighborhoods. Our purpose is to enhance the viability, the attractiveness, and the safety along this vital corridor for the community and for visitors alike. As you, the mayor, and you council members know, for the first time, Rapid City and the state DOT partnered in a year-long study of Mount Rushmore Road. The engineering firm Catermas and Jackson studied, studied everything from historic to future use, private and public property, safety, and of course, aesthetics. In their assessment, they noted safety concerns from what they called visual clutter and driver info overload. They were referring, of course, to signs, to signals, and power lines. They also noted that these visual distractions were an even bigger safety concern because of our narrow roadway. Now I'm sure the last thing the folks at Lamar would want would be to have distracted drivers or for accidents to happen. And we understand that Lamar is a business and they want to stay competitive. But the billboard is already the biggest. It exceeds the city ordinance in size right now. Lamar currently enjoys all the financial rewards that that size of billboard currently uh, generates, but now they want more. They want the north side to flash, to blink, and to move in a way that may be a detriment to the road and a distraction to drivers. The Sign Variance Committee, consisting of representatives of sign companies, planning and zoning, and the City Council, voted unanimously to deny Lamar's request for a variance based on the city attorney's reading and interpretation for granting a request. Denying Lamar's request would not present a financial hardship for that business. In fact, they can continue to operate just the way they are. Now, hopefully, you've all received emails from a few residents and some business owners asking that you deny this variance request. Also tonight, a number of concerned citizens are here and they are taking a stand, and I'd like them to take a stand right now to stand up. They're taking a stand against this variance request. Also, some of the Mount Rushmore Row Group members and other interested citizens would also like to say just a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. Now let's go to Patricia Pummel. There again, Patricia, if you just identify yourself for the record, please. My name is Patricia Pummel, 903 Blaine, in Rapid City. Happy New Year, Council. Mayor Hanks, very nice to see all of you. I'm speaking to this issue as well. I'm a member of the Mount Rushmore Road Group. A few of the topics that Deborah brought up tonight, I'd like just to highlight those because I believe they're very important, obviously, to this topic. First of all is the safety factor. We all travel Mount Rushmore Road, and we don't drive probably 20 or 25 miles an hour. It's a very fast road that hopefully will slow down with the reconstruction, which will start in 2014. 
But nonetheless, we do look at, the, we all do. It's a habit. We look at billboards. We look at other things that catch our attention, obviously, for 1.6 to 2, 2 seconds, which is often, oftentimes can cause an accident. In addition to driving, obviously, there is pedestrian traffic. Hopefully, there'll be more pedestrian traffic as well when the reconstruction takes place after the year two, uh, 2014. My second concern is revenue to the city, and this, has been, this is not with just the Mount Rushmore Road Group. It's been ongoing for some time when we've had discussions about this topic in the past. Rapid City, the city of, receives very little revenue. I think maybe we should receive more. I know there's a fee per year, and I don't, I don't know if there's anything more beyond that. I know it's very little, comparatively speaking, to the amount that the company does bring in. I was curious also whether there's an option for the removal of the billboard on Highway 79, which evidently is going to be taken down with replacement of this, if this should come to pass, with this new billboard on uh, Mount Rushmore Road. There's also a green issue out there. We've also heard of the green issue going throughout America, which is great. It's, it's a tremendous time to be alive right now. But with, with that said, I know, and all due respect, Lamar would like that signed larger so as to see it. Well, we understand that. As you're driving out, down Mount Rushmore Road, there's many things to look at. There's many signs, there's many business <coughs> signs, et cetera, which should be there. But once again, with the renovation, hopefully that road, that will change to, to make it look, again, adequate, adequate for the green issue movement, if you will. There is a plus, I believe, for a Lamar company, as in, again, I realize it's, it's a company. They need to make income, I believe, in the American way as far as um, businesses and ma businesses making money, and Lamar is no exception. There's such a thing as logo signs. There, there's approximately 11 states and also Canada that have, they promote logo signs, and the Lamar, in fact, is a very big part of that. They make very good money off of that, which is great. I think that we should look into that more in our state as well, in our, as well as our city. Lastly, I think there is one positive aspect also to billboards, and that is the Amber Alert, as well as different emergency announcements that come about for billboards. But I hope that we can take another look at this, and maybe this has to be an ongoing topic. Thank you very much, Council. Thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Lisa Modric, item number 62. Thank you, Mayor and City Council. I'm Lisa Modric. It's a pleasure to be here. I always watch you all late at night from the camera. It's fun to be here. But on a more serious note, I also am with the Mount Rushmore Road Group, and we've been very, very active. We've been an organization that's been around for over 20 years, and uh, this group has taken on a vision, and the vision is to clean up that roadway, that amazing roadway that we have right here in one of the hearts of our city, and that is Mount Rushmore Road. And we have some diagrams that we're, we're rather fond of. One of them is a historic diagram from 1955, and we spread it around a lot because the road almost still looks this way, <laughs> because it's that old. So our historic road needs a fix, and we've all known that. And we've been, as an organization, a group of businesses and citizens working very hard to help get some monies, whether it through, be through state or other funding, to get that road changed. And a lot of it has to do with aesthetics. It also has to do with safety. My business is on the corner of St. Patrick and Mount Rushmore Road, and there are accidents that are happening on that intersection constantly, constantly. The summertime is amazing. Traffic that goes through quite fast. That sign that is such a large sign, we're talking a highway, it's almost an interstate sign, it might even be an interstate sign, that is of this uh, variance request. It is so large that any kind of change that can be done to that could create even more problems than we already have. And we do believe in signage. We're all businesses. We have to have it. We would like to also make ours better, too, but not larger. We just want to be more aesthetic. And we want to go along with the program. There's been a lot of money that has been put forward, including by the city, in order to look at a future of Mount Rushmore Road. And we're behind that future. And that future means that cleanup. It means burying poles, and it also means cleaning up our signs. And I think once we start doing beautiful signs, such as our new bank, Black Hills uh, Community Bank, They've got a very attractive sign. It's even got some digital. It's very new. It's attractive, and it's, I think it's going to influence and get all of us thinking about how we can make improvements. But bigger isn't always better. So we believe uh, strongly in enforcing the current, variant, the current uh, rule that it, there is on the signboard. 
they have gone through a great extent to go through this, and we would hope that you would support that ruling and deny this sign, the largest sign on Mount Rushmore Road, from getting any bigger and uh, any brighter than it already is. Thank you. Thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Mike Kwasney. Am I close there, Mike? Okay. Item number 62. Now again, Mike, if you would just identify yourself for the record, then you have the floor, sir. My name is Mike Kwasney. I am a business person. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for coming to our lighting ceremony and making it a great success. Uh, Wilson Park, we had, we planned on about 50 people being there. We ended up with about 300. Didn't have enough coffee and hot chocolate. <laughs> so again, thank you. Um, we did invite Lamar to our meetings, and as of yet, we have not had them there, but we hope to get them there. We still take this opportunity to invite you. Um, we want to design a road that can bring people to that road. We want the signs to be a part of that. As I understand it, there may be some confusion on the sign policies with the city. Um, when we went to the board, there was some confusion on what the policy actually was. Maybe this is a time to visit that policy. Our hope is for the beautification of our community. We do understand and believe every business has the right to earn income. This is not the issue. But rather, some of the goals of the group are to someday have Mount Rushmore Road a point of destination. Much like the Downtown Association has done. This sign would impact negatively what we are trying to accomplish on Wilson Park as a great example. It's right by the park. It could be flashing. We're trying to get new lights, make it a skating pond with nice lighting around it that the community can enjoy. I'm not sure that this sign is going to really help that along. Um, our hope is that we can work with any sign company to accomplish some of our goals for beautification of Mount Rushmore Road. I appreciate your vote of denial. Hopefully we can visit with Lamar in the future and have them help us design something that will more appeal to what we were after. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We also have a speaker request form from Rich Grable. There again, Rich, if you just identify yourself for the record, and the floor is yours, sir. Yep, Rich Grable. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to speak against the sign also, and I, I would uh, speak against it on two, excuse me, for two reasons. First would be aesthetics, and as Lisa, ho hopefully Lisa can leave the pictures here and let you guys look at it, but both the city and the Mount Rushmore Road Group and the state have put a lot of time and money into making uh, Mount Rushmore Road kind of one of the centerpieces of town. And the idea is to green it up, uh, put little pods in, and slow people down. And a big flashy neon sign would just be exactly the opposite of the vision of uh, 8th Street. And the second reason I'd like to speak against is for safety reasons. I think there are only three places with stoplights that you can cross 8th Street, and one of them is on St. Patrick Street, close to sign. Uh, the other is down by Dakota Middle School, and the other is up by the hospital. So it, you're literally taking your life in your own hands when you cross 8th cross Street now, and I think adding a big flashy sign would just uh, further make that so. So thank you. Thank you, Rich. We also have a speaker request form from Jeanette Durlu, item number 62. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I'm Jeanette Durlo, President of the West Boulevard Neighborhood Association. I would just like to add also my support for those that are opposed to this large sign. The city has already denied this oversized digital billboard the company wants to install on Mount Rushmore Road near Mount St. Andrew last December. I asked the City Council to enforce their decision opposing this oversized billboard. It's already a, the largest billboard on Mount Rushmore Road. I think going digital would only add more distraction to traffic, and it certainly would not enha enha enhance the beauty of Mount Rushmore Road. So once again, I'm asking you to enforce the city code that, and, and deny them the, the access to digital. Thank you very much. Thank you. We also have a speaker request form from Mike Modrick, 
who promised it's going to be above 40 tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Say if I go long, can I take a few minutes out of sports? <laughs> Will that work? No. Uh, Mike Modric, I'm here representing myself and also uh, with Modric's Travel as well. Thank you for your, the, the time here. I want to address this purely on the concern of safety. I am a user of the crosswalk there between Modric's Travel over to the Amico, over to Walgreens, on a frequent basis. And crossing Mount Rushmore Road, even with a stoplight, is like playing Russian roulette with an Uzi. We live in the era where yellow means punch it. Red means one to three more cars at driver's discretion, and those are the people who aren't on their cell phones. Add the cell phone, the kids are fighting in the back, changing the radio station. We're, it's distracted driving. We, that, that's a constant battle. We've all gone past some of the digital signs that are in town, and they're very effective. Your eyes are glued to them, and if they change, it's like, oh man, what was that? I didn't get to see it. It's already tough. It's a battle. To be, if you are a pedestrian and you're wanting to cross at the light, I don't know about you, but that light turns green. I'm waiting for a count of about four or five to see, you know, how many semis aren't stopping before I set foot on the road. That's at the light. So I'm hoping you'll deny this simply because how much more distracted driving do we need? How much more do we want? And it's tough right now. Now consider just to throw into the mix the area where that sign's going to be and where it's going to be visible, those drivers are going past the area where Wilson Park Elementary is and Wilson Park, where children could be playing. And let's see, what's across the street? Oh, Dairy Queen. Ever said to a kid, you want to get some ice cream? Ice cream! They're fanatics. Are they going to be worried about safety? Are they going to look both ways before crossing Mount Rushmore Road? And now you've got the driver who's, going, who's looking at the sign. Oh, what did that sign say? And over here, ice cream. The life you save could be one of your own grandchildren. The life you save also could be mine. So I really hope you'll deny this request. And uh, the life you save might be your own, too. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. We also have a speaker request form from Terry Olson from Lamar Advertising. Terry, there again, if you'd identify yourself for the record, and you'll have the floor. Mayor, Council, thank you for hearing me tonight. Now I know why, why old Bill always sat with his back away from the door. <laughs> I am Terry Olson. I'm with Lamar Advertising. I'm the lease manager. Our address is 3839 Sturgis Road here in Rapid City. The billboard in question is, uh, is currently 45 feet tall. It is 10 foot six high by 36 feet wide. Uh, we have a permanent easement on that billboard. What that means is that billboard will be there long after you and I are gone. Now, th th there's a lot of missed data out there, um, a lot of false information. We are not gonna make that sign larger. Basically, all we're gonna do is lift off the north face and lift on a new face the exact same size. We're not going any larger. We're not going any smaller. We're not going any higher. And I understand we might have to do some modification as far as structurally on the billboard. Going on the air is very expensive. Going larger is very expensive. The reason that sign is so high is the obstruction there. And that's one of the um, um, things that are needed for a variance is there obstructions. Now, we can drop that sign down to 30 feet and we can put a digital on there, 254 square feet. I go into Brad's office, I can pull the permit, we'll have it up tomorrow. But we can't because of the obstruction there. All we want to do is grow our business. Um, it'll be the same height, same size. Now, our, our digitals do not blink, flash, or scroll. Now, our digitals seem to get thrown into the mix of everything that's flashing, blinking, and scrolling, making toast, and making spaghetti, and all that. Ours do not do that. Ours have a static message for six seconds. And in one-tenth of a second, they switch. If I could get my guys up there to change that billboard, on, billboard out in one-tenth of a second, it'd be the exact same thing. Ours don't have video on it. Now, um, City of Rapid City does have a sign code as far as blinking, flashing, and scrolling billboards. The state of South Dakota has an ordinance where billboards cannot blink, flash, or scroll. So we don't have an ordinance problem, we have an enforcement problem. Now all we want to do 
is grow our business. We believe Lamar is a responsible billboard company. We're responsible. We care about the environment. The reason we're going digital is digitals are green. We have no vinyl, we have no paper, no gas. Um, no labor that we need, we need there. Um, just down the street, just last year, we reduced a sign. Um, the address on that is uh, 1604 Mount Rushmore Road. We reduced that down from 768 square feet to down to 240 square feet, a 31%, a 70% reduction. The same exact thing over on Mount Rushmore Road. We started sure, the Mount sure. Rushmore project. I'll, I'll just ask you to wrap up if you could, please. Okay. We started the Mount Rushmore cleanup project five years ago. We have 150 billboards in Rapid City, and we changed all the faces out, and we made them 20% smaller. Now, in the spirit of reduction, what we've offered to do Say, Terry, is... Typically, when, okay. when we need well, about we 10, 15 do, seconds, if you could wrap okay. it up, please. What we offer to do is remove another billboard if, if, if allowed to um, put a digital up there. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you. I do not have any additional speaker request forums on any items 49 through 62 inclusive. Does anyone else in the audience wish to speak to any item 49 through 62 inclusive? If not, the chair would look for a motion to close the public comment period. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public comment period and items 49 through 62 inclusive. In discussion on that motion? In discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item number 49, please. Item number 49, first reading of Ordinance 5571, an ordinance amending amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by the City of Rapid City for a rezoning from no use district to mobile home residential district on prop property located at 2807 Cactus Drive. My motion is for approval. We have a motion and a second for approval. We're dealing with item number 49, which is first reading of ordinance 5571. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item number 50, please. First reading of ordinance 5572, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by the city of Rapid City for rezoning from no use district to general agricultural district on property located east of South Valley Drive and south of South Dakota Highway 44. My motion is for approval. We have a motion and a second for approval of first reading of Ordinance 5572. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 51, please. First reading of ordinance number 5501, an ordinance to prohibit feeding of, wild, of wildlife and waterfowl in the city of Rapid City by establishing chapter 16.16 .16 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. Discussion on that motion. Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. I'd like to make a substitute to deny. Okay, we have a substitute motion and a second for denial. So we will take that issue up first. So let's talk about the denial motion. Discussion on that motion. Deb, do you still want the floor? First. I'll yield to Ron first. Well, I have other people. Okay, I'll Deb. go first. Okay. Um, just a couple of things on this. Um, Ken Adele, um, coming up was the most common sense I've heard about the duck feeding um, since we started. Um, again, I think it's the geese. Um, I think uh, the main issue is the cleanup. I think if the cleanup of Canyon Lake and the other areas and you didn't see the fecal matter of duck, I think we wouldn't have a duck ordinance. I don't think we'd have a problem with ducks because we wouldn't have seen uh, what a problem we've had. We've never had a cleanup plan since we redid the park, Canyon Lake Park, uh, 10 years ago. We spent $1.2 million making a area for ducks to be fed and now we're coming back and we're going to find the very people, the taxpayers, money for feeding the ducks. I think some of their plan for the waterfowl management plan on April 6, 2009 was good. I think it's something to be implemented and um, something that would help uh, the first step of what they're trying to accomplish with this ordinance. I think you need to try other things than to put it back on the taxpayer and make it their problem. Um, there's other things when you have unsightliness, fecal dropping, public healthy and safe, safety, and you look and it causes significant damage because of fecal droppings and 
other things, if you come back to the whole program of what we need to do, it's a cleanup plan. It's not an ordinance plan. Um, to me, if you look at the state game fish and parks, they do not find the taxpayers in Pier and Sioux Falls. They actually did it themselves and they mitigated the ducks and did what they needed to do. I think Rapid City can do the same thing without putting it back again on the taxpayers and having them take care of the issue with an ordinance. It's pretty common sense how you take care of your problem. You don't have to make a rule every time you have something wrong. Um, long story short, I don't think this is a good idea. I think we can do everything we did with the waterfowl management plan without having to find people. In South Dakota, other people are doing it right. They're taking care of their issue and not having to make a ordinance or a feeding ban that would um, put it back on the taxpayers. And I believe that this fine will not be implemented because I'd like to see a management plan, how they're going to implement it, where that money's going to go, and how we're going to clean up the park. So I haven't heard anybody tell me how they're going to clean up the fecal matter, whether you have 50 ducks, 100 ducks, or 200 ducks, you still have to clean up the parks. And if you hear the biggest issue in Rapid City about the jewel of our city, it's the way it looks. We have a water quality problem at Canyon Lake. We also have a fecal dropping problem at Canyon Lake. And I don't think finding the taxpayers is the issue. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see, I'm going to go to Karen Gunderson Olson and then Ron Weifenbach will follow. Ms. Olson. Thank you very much. I'm very interested in what Ken had to say. And within the plan, I think it's really important for you to note that the, water, the, the waterfall management plan, which the City of Council approved in April, includes some of the very things that Ken um, Adele is, is describing, which is um, a plan, a strateg strategies to move the geese to other locations through a variety of, of um, methods and that are humane, but who also um, will reduce the kind of um, mess that occurs in those two parks because of geese and overpopulation of, um, of birds. Let me just read to you a minute something which is from the um, Game Fish and Parks annual December um, bird sighting. In 19, in 19, in, um, in 12, 27, 03, there were 439 Canada geese, 560 mallards, and 225 miscellaneous ducks identified during the bird count which occurs throughout the city for a total of 1,224 birds. In 19, in 12, 16, 2007, now there were 1,435 Canada geese located within the city as a part of the bird count, including 1,195 1, mallards, 242 miscellaneous ducks for a total of 2,872 birds identified throughout our city. The, this is occurring for a variety of reasons, um, some of which, um, but mainly, it is because this is a desirable area. The plan incurred, uh, includes a number of um, aversion um, activities, which would be um, disturbing the geese so they choose not to locate in, in Canyon Lake Park, and the same would be done in Memorial Park and at Roosevelt Park, all of which have open water. And if you look at the plan, read the plan, you will see that there is a number of strategies that will be a part of the activity. But let me remind you kind of how I felt about my, my own personal situation. I used to feed the birds at my house, of which I should note, feeding songbirds will not be illegal under this ordinance. But I decided to quit feeding the birds because I got a cat. And when I got a cat, I thought to myself, I'm just inviting the birds to come and be eaten up by my cat. So what you're describing here is a situation where you are providing food sources for geese and ducks and game fish in parks and all of us that you can see the nonsense of trying to reduce the mess when in fact we are a part of the, of the problem. The complaints we get from Blessed Sacrament Church and the park itself of geese, as everyone knows, they don't just eat the grass, they pull up the roots too. So there isn't any grass. So there's a constant maintenance problem. 
And the notion that this is costing taxpayers a lot of money is um, simply not true. Whatever happens, the first step in cleaning up the mess has to be re management of the waterfowl flock first. And so I would urge um, opposition, and I would state my opposition to the amendment that has been offered. Okay. Motion on the floor is a motion to deny. With that, we'll go to Autumn, Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm uh, against an overall just a blanket no feeding of the ducks. I think it's uh, um, doesn't solve the problem. I don't think uh, that's the problem. I think the problem in monks lies uh, uh, an ever increasing and growing problem that we've failed to recognize over the years. And uh, and uh, there's some of the reason that I think that the ordinance is being passed is so that we can pacify our state game fish and parks who refuses to mitigate the ducks unless we pass an ordinance, uh, which is not a state law. It's, it's chosen by them, from my understanding, at this one of these meetings that they sat right out here and told us that the fact that they wouldn't mitigate any of the ducks unless we passed an ordinance that said you can't feed them. Uh, as uh, Mr. Dell had uh, pointed out earlier, we have a, a haven for ducks and geese uh, in the Canyon Lake and in our parks area, you, you look at it, it's a, it's, I don't think there could be a more perfect habitat for those ducks. And my concern is making a blank ordinance that, that uh, uh, I can't imagine that the chief has a plan in mind uh, how to enforce it. Uh, I think that um, if I told everyone in here tomorrow that uh, you can't wear a pink shirt, I could probably look out in the audience to see every one of you wearing one tomorrow. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it's appropriate that in this community we try to be inclusive in the decisions and I don't think that the people that like to feed the ducks or have some propensity to feed the ducks have really been uh, trying to be brought into the group and say how do you think we could mitigate this and make it make sense and then maybe put some time constraints on the period of time that we can feed the ducks, uh, the foods that we feed the ducks. But one of the things that I've been reluctant to talk about is uh, our failure in essence, I think it's already been brought out on the table to keep Canyon Lake clean. Um, I, 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 I heard out here from our, from the podium here, that the reason that we didn't clean up the duck fecal matter is because it would come back. Well, unfortunately, I continue to mow my grass even though it, be, it, it, it grows again. I can go out and I mow it again. I pick the weeds, they come back. The same, same similar type of situation, I, I did, having the opportunity just in the last few days here to, to read some of the mitigation plans. At the same time, I spent some time at the airport looking at their duck mitigation program. They have an extensive duck mitigation program and they don't have a duck feeding ordinance there. Uh, the Game Fish and Parks kills the duck in, in Sioux Falls at their airport. They don't have a non-feeding of the duck ordinance there. Uh, the duck population and the geese population, and I'm kind of broadened by saying ducks, it's easier and simpler that way is an ongoing problem across the nation. It's not just here in Rapid City, but it, it becomes more uh, pronounced when we actually don't take care of, the, of some of the aftermatter of, of, of the problem and, and building a haven that's perfect for their environment. They love the grass. They love the, the no cocktails. They love the, the, the way the, the banks are made so they can walk up and down the banks. Uh, we had a literature program uh, in the parks that we discontinued for some reason unbeknownst to me. Uh, I think we haven't, we haven't taken that opportunity to say, listen, let's build some signs, let's ask our citizens to not feed the ducks. Let's tell them why it's harmful to them to feed the ducks outside the season, why it's harmful to feed them uh, breads and those types of things. I think that you'll find that 95% compliance issue would probably be fine. We can sure pass another ordinance tonight and give Chief Allender lots more stuff to do because obviously they don't have enough to do uh, that they need to go out there and write people tickets for uh, feeding ducks. I, I think it, it doesn't make any sense to me without trying out other options, looking at uh, building nice signs that talk about the species of the ducks. I imagine that I heard some of the numbers here and I, I, I can't tell you one duck from another, but I'm sure there's different kinds of ducks out there and I couldn't tell you how feeding them affects their uh, migration patterns or their health habits, but I think that that would be important and I think that would, would um, 
eliminate a lot of the problem without having to uh, pass an ordinance that I don't think we have any intention of, uh, of cite, citing anyone for, for uh, you know, feeding the ducks. And I think that's kind of a, uh, a nuisance, in, in to say the least, and I'm sure that uh, the police officers in the community would probably agree to that, a tendency to some have some little old lady and, and give her a ticket for feeding the ducks, something she's been doing for 50 years, maybe even longer in our community. So I think that uh, looking at it overall, I can't support a non-feeding of the ducks. It's, I, I, I feel a little bit compelled to explain my situation tonight because I've had a lot of people ask me about it. I've had uh, people talk about it on both sides. But I think that one of the things that, that in this community that we need to do more of is bring people in in the, in the conversation. Not only just go out and find a bunch of people that want to pass an ordinance and say, this is the only way to do it. Let's look at the people that want to feed the ducks and say, how do we work with you and make this thing happen and mitigate the ducks? How do we not just draw our line in the sand and say, tomorrow you can't feed the ducks. We're going to put an ordinance in that we're not going to enforce. So I'm, I'll listen to the rest of the council meeting tonight, but I can't, I haven't seen any evidence yet that would change my mind. I hope that we do enact the, the plan. And I, uh, like I said earlier, the, the um, airport has spent I bet thousands of dollars on their duck and goose mitigation plan, and I don't see anywhere in there where they have a can't feed the duck ordinance. I mean, it wouldn't make sense for people to go out there and do that, but at the same level, I think there's ways to, to go, go about it that appeases the community and brings the community together instead of makes a divisive thing that, which has happened to people that want to feed them, the people that don't want to feed them, passing the ordinance that we're not, gonna, uh, we're not going to uh, enforce. And I mean, just... It, it, it doesn't make sense to me. So with that being said, I think I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion. The motion on the floor is for denial. Any further discussion? Let's go to Alderman Ron uh, Kroger. Thank you, Mayor. I agree uh, a lot with what's been said tonight, actually, on both sides of the issue. Uh, you know, the problem we have is we have a big problem in Rapid City. It's, I mean, Canyon Lake's a mess. Uh, Memorial Park's a mess. All the way down the creek, I mean, all our parks are a mess from ducks and geese, no question about it. The problem I have is, is that we implemented an ordinance today uh, where, it was, where people were prohibited from feeding ducks and everybody quit feeding ducks. Our problem wouldn't go away. The ducks and geese would continue to multiply. They'd still be here. The feeding of the ducks and geese has nothing to do with, with the issue we're dealing with. The feeding of ducks and geese by some people of this community has nothing to do with their diet. They're not here because we are feeding the ducks. And that creates the problem. To put an ordinance into effect, and the last one we had was $25 fine, and we had the police department, we had our city attorney tell us that we're not going to enforce it. We're not going to go out, we're not going to write tickets, we're not going to enforce the ordinance that we're uh, going to prohibit feeding of ducks and geese in Rapid City. So it really makes no sense in my mind to go from either $25 to $5 to $1 to fine people and not implement the ordinance and do the fines. There has to be a better way. I mean, one, I'm, I'm looking at this and I almost think of Game Fish and Parks. Is we, some of us in the council got our, our um, digging a trench here uh, to do a battle, and I think Game Fish and Parks is doing the same thing. There is no reason why they cannot implement a plan uh, to say that we have to have a, a feeding ban when the feeding of the ducks and geese by the people of this community has nothing to do with the number of ducks and geese that are here. It makes no sense at all. And with that, uh, I'm going to support the current motion on the floor. It, it, it makes no sense to put an ordinance into effect and then not follow through with it. I don't know why we cannot just put an ordinance out there that says feeding of ducks and geese is prohibited. End of story. If we can put an ordinance into effect that says we're going to fine you $25 or $5 and we're going to ignore it, then we can do an ordinance that says ducks and geese, feeding of ducks and geese is prohibited. End of story. And game fish and parks can do their job. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Let's go to Patty Martinson. Thank you. I was going to offer um, a motion to uh, um, amendment to change the penalty to $5. I'm not quite sure how that'll work. I, I think it'd be more appropriate to dispose. The motion on the floor currently is to deny. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't do a whole lot of good to try and amend a denial motion. My recommendation is, is either vote this up, vote it down. 
if if it is the motion is defeated, we're back to the original motion. Then you can certainly make a uh, motion to amend to a five dollars. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you. Further discussion. Further discussion. Motion on the floor is for denial. Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed. No. Let's take a roll call, please. <coughs> Hadcock. Wah. Martinson? No. Quaker? No. Costello? No. LaCroix? No. Chapman? No. Olson? No. Weifenbach? No. Kroger? That is four, two, six. Motion fails on a four to six motion, is that correct? Yes. Nope. Four, yeah, four yeses. Okay, very good. Motion. We are back to the original motion. Discussion on the original motion. Let's go to Patty Martinson. Yes, I'd like to, uh, to amend the ordinance to change the penalty to $5. Okay, we have an amendment. We'll be dealing with the amendment first. The amendment would be to change it from, I believe it's currently $25 down to $5. Discussion on the amendment, and we'll, if we can, pl please try to limit your discussion as to the amendment motion. With that, Alderman Kroger, did you want to make a comment on the amendment? <laughs> I told you. I do. How do you do? <laughs> uh, I, my question would be to, I guess, our uh, city attorney. Are we going to enforce the ordinance? Jason Green, city attorney. Or Joe, are you going to go up there? Jason Green. The enforcement of all ordinances is subject to the discretion of the law enforcement and code enforcement agencies. It would be enforced. It's probably not going to get the highest priority in the city. I think that everyone recognizes there are more pressing needs, but as long as it's on the books, it can be enforced, yes. I can't tell you, though, what priority the police department will assign to it or code enforcement. Okay, Alderman Kroger, you still have the floor, sir. Mr. Green. If, if you have an ordinance and you don't insert a fine into it, it would default to the general penalty provision of the ordinance which provides for a $500 fine and 30 days in jail. So if you want the penalty, be, penalty to be something different, you need to specify that in the ordinance. It could be a potential removal from the park Just for the day. You could certainly put that into the ordinance, but in the absence of something about fine and jail time, there would be a default to the general penalty provision. So, I mean, you could write that in the ordinance. That, that could be your penalty or your fine, which could be removal from the park system. Yes or no? Mr. Green? No. If you do not say something about the fine, then you will default to the general penalty provision. If you adopt an ordinance that says you can't feed the ducks, but you don't provide a penalty, your ordinances already provide that penalty. So I don't think that you can adopt an ordinance that says it's illegal to do this, but there's no penalty for doing this. I don't, I guess my last comment is I, I, I'm, I'm not gonna support this motion. The reason I'm not gonna support it, I think it's ludicrous to put an ordinance on the, on, in the books that there is no intent to follow. I can guarantee you we won't write a ticket and the only reason we're doing this is to appease game fish and parks and they don't need that ability uh they they do not need the ability of an ordinance in effect not feeding the ducks to to implement a management plan they do not need that at all and they'll be the first ones to tell you that the feeding of ducks and geese in the park system uh by the general public is no by no means any part of their diet there's no way that a duck or goose could live on, on bread. No way. If that's the only thing they ate, no way. So I will not be supporting the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Dis further discussion on the motion to amend. Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, gener generally, when we have a first reading, um, the council will routinely pass that so that there's at least something out there to be discussed. And I would hope that the council could get to that point. I've heard a number of council members up here tonight state that 
there are other things that we could be doing and other things that we should be doing and if the ordinance said this then they possibly could support it and I, I understand that I don't think that just because one side wins a vote that that gives that winning side an opportunity then to walk on the losing side so I would hope that if we pass first reading tonight that those who are in opposition of that would then come forward and between first reading and second reading truly work with those that are in support of this and then work to change it to what it could look like to represent what those who might disagree with it wanted to look like that's the point of having two readings to it so uh, I would hope that we would still work together to provide whatever is sustainable for our community as it relates to uh, the wa waterfall management plan very good further discussion as to the amendment I'm gonna go to uh, uh, Karen Gunderson Olson and then Debbie will be next Jason it still wasn't clear to me could we as a penalty expel people from the park for doing for feeding Jason I think that you could require someone to leave the park for the day I think that's as far as you could go though let me state the obvious here Jason but that does it taking up the cue that you had that still does not address the fine and if the only punishment would be to expel that person from the park that day it reverts back to the state statute which basically goes up to five hundred dollars or jail time it's actually the city ordinance general penalty okay. provision but yes it would revert back to that portion of the ordinance. Okay. So, in other words if we include that language that they'd be expelled from the park for the day how would that in in I mean in day-to-day -day activity how would that be implemented could it be implemented and how would it be implemented Jason I think you have some real practical problems with implementing a provision like that but I think it could be done it probably have to occur after a due process hearing in front of the court so the day they're expelled from the park is probably six weeks or six months after the fact but you could include that I don't think it's very effective though can I have one more question Go ahead, please you know when I was a lifeguard at Roosevelt swimming pool we used to boot kids who didn't follow the pool rules out of the pool for the day and what is the difference there between this and and our objective here Jason in order to get into the pools you have to pay the admissions fee and as a part of that you agree to follow all of the pool rules so if you're violating the pool rules you can be excluded and it's very easy to do with a pool because it's a confined space and admission is conditional it's limited it's open for only finite hours the park is essentially available anytime so it's very difficult to exclude somebody from Canyon Lake Park for instance when there it's it's a vast area it's wide open I don't think it works practically at all and I don't think legally it's very effective it's gonna create more problems in my mind than it's gonna solve and I have one remaining question which is that um, we've been kind of heavy-handed with game fish and parks and I just want the general public to understand that this is that they are abiding by the federal migratory bird rules and the state of South Dakota game fish and parks would have to apply to to the federal level to get the permits to make any change in the population of our um, waterfowl in rapid in rapid city within our city boundaries so I, I would I think it's inappropriate to say that game fish and parks is being heavy-handed um, also the reference to the two airports I think that's comparing apples and oranges um, there are fences around the airports you can't come out there and feed ducks in the airport for a whole lot of reasons that have nothing to do with geese and ducks but but mainly I was going to say game fish and parks is merely abiding by what they believe is the intent at the federal level for them to get a permit from the federal under the federal migratory bird act in order to make the the possibility of managing and reducing the um, population in the community and I should say that if you've read the plan there are a number of proposals within the plan that reduces the population based on things that are um, very generic so thank you thank you just a reminder the motion on the floor is the motion to amend and then if that does pass we'll be back to the original motion okay let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock and then Rod and Weifenbach you'll be after her just a couple comments the heavy-handed if I think they are being heavy-handed at game fish and parks if they're not finding peer when we asked them at legal and finance if they'd find their people in peer they said no 
for their geese and ducks. So that's kind of heavy handed to come in Rapid City and change our rules, but not change your own. Um, the other thing is, is if we have a code enforcement, we're gonna fi find people $5 fine for feeding the ducks. How much are we gonna find the parks department in Rapid City for not cleaning up the duck debris that's out there? Cause that's, if it's the jewel of our area, I'd say that's the biggest issue. And if there's gonna be fine for other people that are causing issues, um, with debris and stuff in their yards, and we find them, why aren't we doing anything with our parks? That park has looked horrible for two years. We have not cleaned it up to make a point that it's a duck problem, and again, I don't believe it's a feeding problem, it's a cleanup problem. I think $5 fine, expulsion for the park, or anything you do, if you're not gonna enforce it, why do you have an ordinance? Again, it's being heavy-handed by the Game Fish and Parks, to do it in one area in Rapid City and not do it around South Dakota. If you're gonna do it, make sure it's all, all across the board and we're all doing it in South Dakota. It makes it look a little bit better than just one area. Especially again, we made this area and we're gonna fine people $5 that we're not gonna enforce for something that we've enjoyed for 50 years or more that we made 10 years ago again, bigger feeding area for the citizens of Rapid City because it was a lovely, enjoyable thing to do. Nobody's gonna go find their grandfather, or their grandmother, and if you have three kids or any kids, nobody's going up to them. It's, it's ridiculous. I've never heard such a crazy thing in my entire life. We are not finding the people of Rapid City. I'd like to see in a year how many fines we set out, but we did appease it by saying we were gonna do it because it's gonna make a less duck population by mitigating the ducks. Again, you still have the feces, the issue is the debris that it's causing, not just the ducks. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jason, would it, uh, I have a uh, question for Mr. Green. Please go ahead. Mr. Green, would it be appropriate just for us to kick the ducks out of the pond? You can certainly try. <laughs> uh, I, being all kidding aside, I, I was at the meeting, I thought all council people were present at the meeting when the Game Fish and Parks people were here. And I wanna, went on the record and asked him specifically, the head of the Game Fish and Parks, and I believe his name was Art, if there was a state law or statute or, or, or some statute that uh, would, would keep him from mitigating the duck population if, if we made application. And his comment was no. It was his own choosing to do that. So I wanna be very clear about that, that Nobody's being heaven handed here. I'm just presenting the facts as, as I went on a public record. We can go back to those minutes, and I believe all council members were present at the time. I did, uh, I'm not in favor of the no feeding. And the other question I have, which is very evident to me, which I don't even, nobody's approached, is uh, this duck feeding ordinance. Is it just a duck feeding ordinance for the park? What happens when I step across the street and feed the ducks? I, I think I'd like to ask that question to Mr. Yep. Green. Very good. Mr. Green, what happens if this is not on city property? This would apply throughout the city, not just in the park. Well, I think then, so if someone actually was feeding the ducks in their front yard, it would be difficult to remove them from the park. So understanding the constraints that would be there. So I just wanna make sure if we're gonna pass something that we all clearly understand what we're passing. So I, I, I'm, I'm adamantly against just blanketing this thing and thinking it's gonna go away because it's not. There's, there's several levels and several opportunities that we haven't even looked at yet. And some of them that we've been, we had in the past that have been went by the wayside unbeknownst to this council. Thank you. Thank you. Additional comments. Let's go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. I have a question, question for Mr. Green. Go ahead, please. Uh, and maybe Mr. Cole at the same time. Uh, we have a deer management program uh, presently in effect in Rapid City. Do we have the same ordinance that are similar to one with this, this duck feeding ban? Jason? Yes, there's an ordinance that prohibits feeding deer. And what's the fine for that? I'm, I'm not sure if it's 200 or 500. It may be subject to the general penalty provision, but it's okay. two or five. Okay. That's all I wanted. Okay. Thank you. Any additional comments? The motion on the floor is a motion to amend. And from this point forward, we're gonna keep it strictly to the motion amend, and then we'll see how that goes, and then we'll go back to the original motion. Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. Jason, how many people have we fined for feeding the deer or that ordinance you just talked about? Okay, Jason, you know? why don't you answer that, and then go ahead. I can't remember a prosecution for violation of that ordinance during my time in the city attorney's office. 
However, when I supervised code enforcement, I know that there were several times that code enforcement used that ordinance as a mechanism to uh, encourage people to stop feeding deer, and it was successful. Okay. So they didn't find anybody, they just told them not to feed them? As a violation of the, the city code, yes. And or they were still feeding them, they just did it without you telling them. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Let's go to Alderwoman Kiranos. And there again, the motion on the floor is to amend. We're talking about the amendment uh, to take it from $25 down to $5. Karen? The ordinance currently, as is being proposed, reads in 6.16.020, feeding of wild animals and waterfowl, waterfowl prohibited. No person shall purposely or knowingly with intent to provide such food, feed, bait, or in any manner provide access to food to any wild animal or waterfowl within the corporate limits of the city of Rapid City on lands, either publicly or privately owned. Karen, is this dealing with the five... The, a motion to amend from $25 down to 5 Well, what the point was, I heard a conversation that said there's currently something on the books about feeding deer. This is about feeding deer. Ducks. It mentions deer. Okay. So we are talking it is one and the same. So I, it's just confusing the issue that this, is what our, this would be what our ordinance would be. Okay. Correct, Jason? Okay. Yes, this ordinance is broader than just wild or waterfowl. Right. Thank you. The motion on the floor is the motion to amend. Let's dispose of that and we'll be back to full debate on the motion if it passes to amend. Okay. Any further discussion on the motion to amend? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. $5. Let's go ahead and I assume that's without court costs. Jason? The fine portion would be $5, but when it goes through the magistrate court process, court costs would be added. And there's nothing the city council can do to alleviate that. You make or accept a friendly amendment or a clarification to make it five dollars and no court costs would be just like a parking ticket. I don't think we can. Let's, let's have Sam. Let's ask that question of Jason Green. Or could we do that, Jason? No, that would exceed the authority of the uh, city council. And in fact. Uh, certain municipalities on the eastern half of the state have been sued by the attorney general for not collecting the um, liquidated cost portion of um, speeding tickets, municipal ordinance violations, speeding tickets in particular. Okay. Parking tickets are just a different animal, and nobody has uh, gone down the road of attempting to include those on parking tickets. There's been a lot of discussion about that, and parking tickets, all I can say about it is it's different. Okay. So there's no reason why we couldn't try it. Well, I can tell you that other municipalities are being sued by the Attorney General right now for not doing that. So my advice to you is not to do that. Yep. Anything else, Sam? No, sir. Okay. Motion on the floor is to amend. Everyone clear in the motion. The amendment is to take it from $25 down to $5. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. Let's take a quick roll call, please. Wah. Mike. Costello. Okay, I'm sorry. Quaker? Aye. Okay. Costello? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Olson? Aye. Weifenbach? No. Kroger? No. Hadcock? No. That okay. is seven, seven yes. to three. Yep. Okay, the amendment passes. We are back to the uh, uh, original motion as amended. Everyone clear on that? And this, keep in mind, this is first reading. We'll have a Second crack at this. Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, repeating myself again, I would say at least based on what's, it seems like what's happening so far is that uh, the council could approve first reading tonight. I would hope that those that have some objection would get in the game and um, come and bring those concerns and actually work uh, to change some of these things if they want them changed by second reading. I would hope that people would, would, would participate and do that. Those are my comments. Thank you. Motion on the floor is a motion, is the original motion as amended. Let's go to Alderman Ron Kroger. Thank you, Mayor. We've had a lot of discussion on this, uh, the previous ordinance and uh, there was a lot of suggestions and none of those have even been implemented or and a lot of them were with at no cost. 
But my question is, is looking at this plan, uh, if it is approved, what are we going to do with the problem we have today? And that's the condition of the parks. This plan takes a long period of time to implement, and the mess that's there isn't going to go away by uh, creating this ordinance. So I guess my question to the council is, is when we get to second reading, I would like to know what the plan is to clean up the park system because uh, having a duck feeding ordinance isn't going to do that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. And that is a fair question. That's probably a little bit off, and I hate to say it's off topic because it really is related, but that is a, a discussion I believe the council needs to have. There again, the motion on the floor is a motion to approve as amended. And I'm just going to make a point of clarification here. Uh, if you actually look at 6.16-050, I assume that the motion maker, the intent was to strike A, B, or let's see, uh, B and C and deal only with uh, item A to include $5. And the reason I say that, where's Jason? And the reason is, is if we, depending on how this is interpreted, we want to make sure it's it is five dollars and that is the permanent fee because currently what we have is an escalator in here where it starts at twenty five dollars and then goes to fifty dollars and then back up to the full go ahead jason i believe under the amendment that uh, we could strike just about all that language and um since the amendment was approved if first reading is approved we would bring that language to the committee yeah. for Very second good. reading just want to make sure everybody understands it further discussion let's on the original motion as amended let's go to alderwoman deb hadcock Actually, we did bring forward on legal and finance an attempt to try to do something about the cleanup of the park. And at this point, um, you need 200000 So if somebody has a better idea um, and how we do it, maybe the mayor can work with the Parks Department. Um, we need to do something. And I think it's part of, again, this ordinance as well. In order to pass this, uh, my main issue here, again, is the cleanup of the park. Um, the duck thing can be mitigated. Things can be done. <coughs> And we know with $5 fine, it's not a big fine, but the main thing here is I just wanted something done with the cleanup of the park. And so far, we've killed it. And I would hope by this ordinance um, moving forward that maybe that uh, wildlife plan group can go back and take a look at uh, the areas in Rapid City and figure out how we're going to do the cleanup plan and where that funding cost is going to come from. Thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor is the original motion as amended. Everyone clear on that motion. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? No. Let's take a quick roll call, please. Martinson? Aye. Quaker? Aye. Costello? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Chapman? Aye. Olson? Aye. Weifenbach? No. Kroger? No. Hadcock? No. And Wah? Six yes, four no. Okay, motion passes the first reading on a vote of six to four. Thank you, everyone, for that discussion. Item number 52, please. Karen, can I believe we can hear? Second reading of ordinance number 5569, an ordinance to allow for the conversion of an on-premise sign to off-premises sign for more than one parcel by amending section, subsection Q of section 15.28.050 of the Rapid City Municipal Code. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval of second reading of Ordinance 5569. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderman Sam Quaker. Is your mic, is your mic on there, Sam? Thank you, Mayor. Could we have a confirmation of, of when, of what year or what time frame that this sign went up? Do we know when, it, when the original sign? Let's go to Marcia Elkins. This is unrelated to the item that there was testimony on earlier this evening. This is the ordinance that allows uh, an existing sign that is being platted off uh, to remain uh, when it's on a separate lot. I apologize. That's all right. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Motion on the floor is for approval of second reading of Ordinance 5569. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 53, please. Authorize Mayor and Finance Officer to sign a license, a license agreement for Police Department training at 108 East Main Street. My motion is for approval. We have a motion, second for approval, and discussion on that motion. In discussion. 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item 54, please. I'm sorry. 54. Thank you. A request to authorize Mayor and Finance Officer to sign supplemental memorandum of understanding between the City of Rapid City and the Rapid City Area School District to provide for reimbursement of design expenses for a performing arts facility. My motion is for approval. Second. We have a motion and a second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'm going to ask for just a little latitude, and, I, and I'll be brief in my comments. Um, I, I think that the city all of us, not just the city council and the mayor and the elected officials, but I'm talking about the historic preservation community, uh, the citizens of Rapid City, the school district, the city. Um, I think we have a great opportunity here to figure out how to get historic preservation done where it's inclusive in terms of a process of renovation. And I would hope that we all would show some leadership in this as it relates to Dakota Middle School and that performing arts center that's gonna be developed there. Uh, I know there's been talk um, and all of the discussion about what happened on the boulevard with Wendell's and HBC and all of that, but I think this is a real opportunity to show how to get it right, and I think it just takes some leadership on our part uh, in particular to, to move that process forward where historic preservation is at the table to be inclusive in the process as opposed to um, uh, not. A second point, I, you know, I just had a conference call just last night with uh, the owner of the McGillicuddy House, which is right off of 8th Street. And I mean, I think that's another opportunity that you know, we all have uh, in looking how to preserve that facility and at the same time be inclusive in terms of figuring out how to um, renovate or upgrade or do something with that facility, maybe as it relates to reconciliation, which is the spirit of what McGillicuddy was all about. Uh, bringing all of these different factions together to do that, and I hope that we take that opportunity to do that. Thank you. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion pa passes. We're on to the Public Works Committee items. Item number 55, please. <laughs> Excuse me. Item number 55 is deny a request to allow a residential driveway approach opening width greater than 20 feet for a residential lot located at 4122 Quimet Court in Red Rock Meadows subdivision. And uh, I'd like to acknowledge the applicant's withdrawal of the request. Okay, we have a motion and a second to acknowledge the applicant's withdrawal. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Yes, let's go to Aaron Costello. Thank you. Marcia, is the picture that we have up in reference to this, this item 55? Yes, sir. Okay, could you explain to me, because in public works, this was, it was moved to deny, and then it was continued, and then now we're back, and, and the applicant's asking for withdrawal. What's transpired in the meantime? I was informed that the uh, owner of the property now, the property has transferred to the new owner, uh, did contact uh, the applicant on this, uh, Mandalay Homes, and indicate that they were no longer interested in pursuing the exception. They would live with the driveway, uh, complying with the requirements of the code, which has already been poured. Okay, thank you very much, Marcia. Um, one of the subtleties of this that I don't want to get lost in, in this acknowledgement of withdrawal is that this driveway, the builder essentially tried to sneak one in on the city. He, he, he put all the forms in place with a 30-foot driveway width, knowing full well that it was not allowed. And it's just by fortune that a city inspector happened to, to come by and see that. So, and this is certainly not the first time this has happened. Uh, they've been caught and they've not been caught. So if it's a case where uh, this, it is essential that uh, we, we conserve curb space for parking, we need to consider and look at ways where there's, there's a way to enforce it to where, you know, there, there's some sort of, I don't know, perhaps a penalty if people knowingly go against city code because to me it just eats up a lot of our time. It's taken up staff time, it's taken up our time here at the dais, and all because somebody tried to be a little sneaky. And uh, uh, certainly um, there'll, there'll be some discussion, we can look at something coming forward there. Thank you very much. Okay. 
Thank you. Motion on the floor is to acknowledge. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Item number 56, please. Item number 56 is a request by Bob Brandt to appeal the denial of the request exception to city standards to allow a non-conforming water and sewer line. And uh, I would vote uh, in favor of the appeal, or I would move that we, we are we looking to? No, we don't. Nope, we need a motion on the floor. Yeah, I, I move that um, we, we grant the request to appeal. Okay, so your motion would be to grant the appeal, or actually grant the exception to the city standards right. to allow a nonconforming water and sewer line. Yes, okay. I believe that's what I said. We have a motion and a second. Discussion on that motion. The motion would actually grant uh, the exception request. Everyone clear on that motion? Any discussion on that motion? Uh, let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd like to just hear from our public works. Okay, let's go to Robert Ellis, public works director. Just a little bit of background information on this. Current standards do not allow non-conforming water or sewer service lines. And by non-conforming, I mean not allowing a service line to cross one person's property to get to another person's property. Uh, the request is for a parcel that um, has currently been platted as one lot. They're requesting to plot it off as three lots, and because of that platting additional lots, there would be a non-conforming service line for two of the lots, and that's what the request is. Uh, staff um, has uh, declined or denied the request. Uh, ordinance does allow under extraordinary circumstances that an exception be granted and on the condition that a covenant agreement is signed, that uh, the property owner not protest any future assessments, and also that easements for those private service lines uh, would be uh, created to allow future um, maintenance of the lines by the property owners. Uh, I didn't feel that this was an extraordinary circumstance. I feel that um, up front when this initial plat was created that the, the problem of future subdivision would create this non-conforming standard issue and we were sure that wouldn't be the case. It turns out today it is the case. Uh, so I think that uh, better planning up front probably would have prevented this altogether. But uh, again, it's really not an extraordinary circumstance. We did um, deny the request. Yep, Mr. Chapman, you still have the floor, sir. I, I have a question for the applicant. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Brandt, the, um, what makes this extraordinary? If, if that's the language that we need to, to approve, is what makes this case extraordinary? Mr. Brandt? The lines are already in. Um, the, the line goes to the west of, the, of the, where the three restaurants will be. The, so the sewer line comes out of the back of the on the border, connects to this line, and then goes to the north to connect to the city sewer. Um, there's no way now to get that line out to the front of the building and out to Century Road. So that's what makes this a, a, an extraordinary circumstance right now. There's really no way you'd have to literally tear the restaurant down to get the walk, to get the sewer to flow to the east instead of to the back. Yep. Mr. Chapman, you still have the floor, sir. Our, our public works director said that this, I guess, was previously discussed at uh, platting or this was previously talked about. Is that the case? When it was, when it was a planned commercial development on just one lot, uh, it's basically like a condominium. The, the, the restaurants own the building, but the parking lot, the sewer, and everything else is all like common property. And um, I mean, when we discussed it originally with Marsha, I mean, that was the easiest way to go. For, one of the biggest reasons we didn't have to, co to construct that $70,000 service road to the north. Um, Honestly, if it wasn't for this lawsuit, the owners would certainly, you know, not want to, to split this lot up. It's going to cost him seventy to eighty thousand dollars of his own money to split these into three lots. Um, if we don't get it through the planning commission, the judge is probably going to order it. Mr. Chapman, you still have the floor, sir. Thank you. Anything else? Let's go to Alderman Deb Hadcock. Does it say what size water line there's on there? Robert, Robert, by chance. Robert, what kind of, what size water lines do you <coughs> It would be an eight inch water line, a six inch sewer line. 
would the water pressure fire flow for those three lots be able to take an eight inch line without having to break those into pieces and make them? Um, yeah, yeah, fire flow is adequate with that eight inch line. So there isn't a safety issue with us letting them do this? No. With sewer or water? No. Thank you, sir. Okay. Yep. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I'm trying to understand this by looking at this picture, and I, I can't read it, and I can't understand the drawing, but I, uh, I don't understand the, the, the sewer that comes out the back north side, or the it comes out the south side of the the of west the, side, the west side of on the border, yes. and crosses to the west. And goes to the north. It's a, there's a city main out in the service road to the north. Okay. So it comes out the west side, then goes, okay. So it'll be crossing over which lot on here, I guess? I, um, I mean, it, it, we're going to split it up into three lots. The lot farthest to the north is lot 2A. The lot that on the border is is lot 2B. And then the farthest one south is lot 2C. So the lines, the lines going to, to lot 2C would actually cross two lots. The lines going to the on the border would cross one lot. These lots are going to be owned by somebody else, evidently? Yes. Mr. Mayor, I guess. I don't yep. Know. Okay. Are they, going to, are they going to hook into these sewer lines? Yes, there's a, there's a, a six-inch main. It's really a sewer main that goes all the way across the west side of the property. Uh, it terminates at a manhole over on lot 2C. Um, so, so the future restaurant on lot 2C will connect right into that manhole. Um, and, and a lot 2A will, will tie right into the line. Both restaurants will go, the, the sewer lines will go right out of the restaurants straight to the west and into this main. Let's be a little bit careful when we're using main. It, what we're talking about is a service line here. Right. Mains are owned by the city, service lines are owned by the property owner. So let's be a little bit careful there. And, and Ron, you still have the floor, sir. So, so the, all three of those properties will be able to hook into that, that uh, not main, but that service line there. Six inch that, line, that's correct. Which will, in that, I guess my question would be for Robert, and that would service those three. Robert? Yes, that the eight inch water would service those three properties, and the six inch sewer would service those three properties. So if we didn't, I mean, what, what's the difference here? This seems like common sense to me, but. The, but it's right. I don't think there, and, and let me step in here. I don't think there's any concerns as far as the capacity when, when this was developed, the capacity is there. The question is, is whether or not we're going to allow them to create a, a, a non-standard, uh, basically, line where you actually have service lines crossing other properties. We typically don't allow that. And that is the right. request by Mr. Brandt today is to actually allow that. I understand, and I'm not, I'm definitely not one to be build it and then ask for forgiveness, but I, I'm not sure that I quite understand everything here. It, judging from the pictures and, and the green, the green on this, uh, Mr. Mayor, is the sewer, is the private sewer main. Marsha, yeah, can okay. you can you go up and see? If, I suppose. Are we working up there, Marsha? No. Comes out the west end and heads north. But. That's the, the water lines there. Okay. Marsha, I don't think anything's showing up, not up here. Is it up behind us? This is the water line. Goes up in, in front of the buildings to the east of the building, goes across the parking lot. And the sewer line comes in on the west side of the buildings. Um, this is where the service road is. Okay. between North Street and the property. Bob, we, we, we're not, nothing's working here. Our, our audio I, I got it, Mr. Mayor. I understand where it's at now because it seems to be right before that big drop off. Yeah. Right? Good right on that, right as the road comes in. It's on the opposite side of the road. I, I, I don't have an issue with it. Thank you. Okay. Further discussion, let's go to Alderman Ron Kroger. Thank you, Mayor. If I could ask uh, Mr. Ellis a question. Sure, please go ahead. Robert, you, when we've approved some of these, we had some requirements and what was it, covenants agreement and what else? Creation of an easement over those lines. And also, I think there was uh, agreement not to fight any assessment project. That'd be part of the covenant agreement. I yes. would uh, make, an, er, make an amendment to the motion to include those. Second. I think that's actually- Or was that in there? 
that's actually a requirement to actually grant this variance. So, I mean, that would be, I believe that documentation has already been done. Is that correct, Robert? It's been submitted or not? The governor's agreement's been signed and, and submitted to the city attorney's office today. Uh, let's go to Joel just to verify. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I was going to actually suggest that it be clear that the, the grant in the motion, if, you, if the council decided to proceed with this, be conditioned on all those documents being approved. Um, whether they've been submitted, I'm, I'm not sure yet. We would want the covenant agreement, we want the easements in place, and we want to make sure that everybody's in agreement on it. So I would just like it to be clear that the motion is conditioned upon those agreements being approved by the council. I'm pretty sure that's what Aaron said. It was, yeah. <laughs> it was quoted in there, but yeah. Okay, further discussion. Let's go to Alderman Malcolm Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question for Mr. Brandt. Um, I take it that this is time dependent? Yes, sir. We, uh, we would certainly like to get to the Planning Commission on Thursday um, if we get approval. And this is really the last issue uh, to hold up this platting. Um, we go to the Planning Commission on Thursday. It will come to you uh, for approval on the 18th. And the trial is the 25th, 26th, 27th of January. So we would certainly like to have this done before it goes to trial. I'd, I'd be less than honest with myself if I didn't say what I'm about to say. Uh, Bob, we've been through this before. I, I will not support this. I think what we do when we support these crisscross, non-conforming lines crossing other property is that what we're doing is just creating a problem for future council that the covenants can be signed if, if, if they are signed, but at some point, 25, 50, 75 years from now, there will be a dispute between those landowners and the city will end up bearing the brunt of that cost. That's just my opinion about this. Uh, I will not support this. Um, I don't think it's good form for the council to start approving things contingent on something being turned in. Um, get the documents turned in. Let's have all the documents. We should be the final approval of something. We shouldn't be approving things based on if they're turned in or if they're not turned in. Our city attorney's office doesn't know if they're turned in or if uh, what condition those are, if there are going to be changes to it. Um, I will not support this, but I seemingly can count votes and I can see where this is going. <laughs> Motion on the floor is to grant the exception. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It, it, my question would be for our public work director. Um, okay. Robert, if, this, if we approve this, is, can, we, can we make this a city main? Is that... Is that is Robert? I was actually going to give the three options that I see out there in preference of uh, what the public works office would like to see. The first option would be the property to the east of this is going to be developed. It's undeveloped now. Public mains could be installed and put in public right away that would be platted with that development down to the, that final lot that you see on the south side. I don't know if that's feasible. I don't know if that's in the, the, the plan of that, the owner of that property. I believe it may be um, property that the applicant is representing as well. Second option would be to approve the non-conforming lines, which is before you today. Um, and then the third least desirable option would be dedicate those mains as public mains and the city has to contend with the future maintenance of them. They're in parking lots with cars parked over them. They're on the back side of the property, which has no access, so the city doesn't want to own those mains. I would call that your least desirable option. Okay. Thank you, Robert. Then the other question I have, I'm not sure who to address it to, Mr. Mayor, but I, I didn't realize that there was missing documentation. That if we're missing some documentation, I would have a tendency to agree with Alderman Chapman that this maybe needs to wait until we get all the documentation that's required to, to accomplish this. Okay. So I'm not sure who Mayor, I'll address that to. Again, the, just so you know, the motion on the floor is contingent upon all the documentation being approved by the city uh, by the city attorney's office. I'm sorry. It all comes back to the council. It, okay. So, w if we approve this, it would all come back to us anyway. Well, it'll have to because there's easements involved along with the covenants, and what you'll need to do is approve, uh, authorize the mayor and the finance officer to sign those agreements. So you'll be seeing those coming back through anyway. I think I've formulated the question for our city attorney. So okay. if we approve this, are you okay with this? I mean, with the paperwork process, or do we need to wait for the proper paperwork? I, I think it would be fine to approve it tonight, conditioned on the granting, but understand that if you don't approve the agreements, then when we bring them back, then, then there would be no variance. 
or we would have to reach agreement on it. Um, probably would come back at the next meeting. So, so if we didn't approve this, we would have, we'd be putting the cart in front of the horse and we'd have like a... Again, I think you could approve it this evening conditioned upon all the documents that Robert mentioned in the ordinance. However, you could also, I think, continue it and then we could bring the documents forward simultaneously. Uh, however the council wants to proceed so you're so, so mr. mayor I get Go ahead. My, my, so you're comfortable with with us if we approved it and, and contingent upon the document as the motion has been set forth correct okay thank you okay further the dis, further discussion right. further discussion let's go to Aaron Costello thank you mr. mayor I have a few questions for mr. Brandt Yep. Go ahead, please. If, if this exception is denied, what are your options? On the border, would have to probably shut down. You'd have to dig underneath the foundation, reroute the sewer line out to the front. Um, you'd have to extend those lots out to. Uh, there's a, a platting proposal for a for one lot across to the east. Um, across Century Road. Uh, these lots right now do not go all the way. Lot 1, go, Lot A, 2A goes to Century Road. Then Century Road kind of veers to the southeast so it doesn't touch lots 2 and 3, or, or 2B and 2C. Um, the easements are in. You can see the easements are up there. They're on the, they're on the document. Um, Here's the, the covenant agreement that was prepared by the city attorney's office. It was signed and notarized by the owners today, and I did take it to the city attorney's office this afternoon. Were these, so now essentially those lots are landlocked? Is that, like, for lack of a better phrase, maybe Robert, you, they're essentially landlocked from city sewer connections. Robert? I see him nodding, so. <laughs> I believe so looking at what the initial plan uh, that's coming in on the property to the east of this it looks like it'll be landlocked for public right-of-way public access to water and sewer lines yes that last lot at least so this question is for anybody who has an answer what could have been done differently initially and how does the cost of that compare to what would have to be done if this exception is denied. Arsh, you want to give that a... Yes, when this first came in, we discussed the fact that uh, it would likely, with these three restaurant sites, be something that would want to be subdivided, and we discussed that with the applicant. What we identified was putting in a main, a true main, that would uh, run along the eastern side of this, uh, and that it would be platted off, again, rather than running it through the uh, properties. Uh, again, the staff was assured that they had no intention of subdividing the property and for a variety of reasons that has changed since then. So uh, it was talked about and we tried to avoid the situation. However, the applicant uh, made choices to proceed in that light. You still have the floor. Thank you. So, Mr. Brand, what's the estimated cost if had you done what Marcia suggest suggested initially? When this was, when this was uh, plan development was done a year ago, there was no definitive plans um, for developing that, for what a better term of it is that uh, the Horseshoe Bar property. Um, there was no mains out in front. The only water and sewer lines available to us at the time were on the north side of this property. Um, again, the owners do not want to do this. Um, it, it's costing them $70,000 right up front just for that service road. Um, so you don't know how much it would cost, is what you're saying? Is that getting forced to do? I, I don't know how you would get the sewer line w without tearing down the on the border. I don't know how you get the sewer line to go to the to the west, right to the east. Maybe I'm asking this question poorly. I'm trying to find out how much it would, what costs would have been incurred to do this right the first time. And then I want to compare those to the costs that we might see now. There was no water or sewer mains available to the e on the east side of this at the time. Right. I yield to the floor. Okay. Further discussion. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, 
I think that something came to light here in my mind that I don't think maybe everybody's catching here, but this is basically a situation that for some reason you feel the outcome of this lawsuit is going to force you to hand over these two uh, properties on the north side to a different owner. Is that what I'm understanding? That's what's making this happen as we talk about extraordinary items or whatever the case may be. There wasn't really a contingency in the beginning that this would happen? No, this was always planned to be on one lot. Um, with It'd be like a condominium. Right. I, the restaurants would own their pad, yep. um, and, the, and the, sur the water, sewer lines, and the parking lot would be just like your common area in a condominium. Okay, so that, that's Mayor, what the plan was in the beginning, and, the, and it would right. still be, if it wasn't for this lawsuit, okay. Bob, um, there would be no reason to, to, to split these lots up. Okay, Mr. Ahead. Mayor, I understand that because I've, I've driven by this property several times and obviously commend you guys for what you've done on that area up there and understand there was uh, signs for lease for these, these spots, so I understand that part of it. But the part I guess I didn't understand and maybe the rest of the council don't understand is you're getting your hand forced to turn over these lots evidently to another owner for whatever transaction happened somewhere along the line that wasn't evidently something's getting reversed. Or something so these two front lodge lots to the north are going to be owned by a different party is that my understanding no the Weaslers will still own them will still own the two other lots um, this minor partner his only interest is in the on the border property so that that's why we're trying to split the on the border property off so that we can continue to develop and get restaurants on those other two lots so mr. mayor so basically what's going to happen is it is that's what's going to change there's there's more than one partner in the on the border and, and the on the border is actually the 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 property that uh is going to be owned by a different person he's still going to have a minor he's still he's not going to lose his the minor partner is not going to lose his ownership his percentage of ownership and on the border what he will lose is any of the ownership in the other two okay. lots okay i understand now i and I'm not sure, I'm not, the rest of the council understands um, what's happening here. And I don't know what tra what took place, but I see where, it, where it's going. Um, thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? The motion on the floor is to grant, let me make sure I get this right, grant the request for an exception to the city standards to allow a non-conforming water and sewer line. And that was also contingent upon the presentation or the um, the approval of all the appropriate documentation as far as easements and everyone clear with clear in the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. No. Let's take a roll call, please. Quaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no. Costello? Aye. LaCroix? Aye. Chapman? No. Olson? Weifenbach? Aye. Kroger? Aye. Hadcock? Aye. Wah? Aye. Martinson? Aye. Motion passes on a six to four vote. Great. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Item number 57, please. Mr. Costello. My pleasure. Item number 57 is to approve with stipulations approve with stipulations a request by FMG Incorporated for Good Samaritan Society to consider an application for a fence height exception to allow a seven foot high fence in the medium density residential and general agricultural zoning district generally described as being southwest of the intersection of St. Martin's Drive and Sturgis Road, and I move to approve with stipulations. We have a motion and a second for approval of stipulations. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. 58, please. Number 58 is to approve a request by K1 Construction Incorporated to consider an application for a vacation of a portion of a minor drainage and utility easement an area generally described as being located at 6515 Seminole Lane, and I move for approval. We have a motion, second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Let's go to Alderwoman Deb Hadcock. J 
just a question for the applicant. Okay, go ahead, please. Ken, was your intention tonight to have this approved or continued? Approved. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Kroger. Uh, my question would be for Mr. First. Ken, what were you asking for? You would like something set up so you could look at, at changing this, or is that what you were asking for? No, we've got all the drainage and stuff through engineering. Right, drainage. I mean, this yours is all approved, but weren't you asking for something else? Let's go to Joel and Dean. I think he can probably answer that. That's all right, Mr. Kroger. Thank you, Mayor. There was actually at the committee meeting two discussions that occurred. Um, there was a discussion of the actual exception request, and then the committee decided that this was a problem, how can we solve it? And I, I believe when he spoke, what he was referring to is the count, the committee had asked that staff take this to the residential contractor board and see if there were some solutions. Staff did do that, so it should be on the residential contract board, and I believe that's what the applicant was initially addressing. Okay. It, everyone, yes, Mr. Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm trying to realize how when we survey these lots, don't we survey them off the lot pins? Um, yes, I'm you. not sure. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'd have a question for Go Mr. Ahead, First. And, and, and who surveyed your lots? A lot of times the builders do their own layout, staking and layout. There is no code at this point in time that says you know, somebody, an engineer has to come in and stake these lots. Um, what happened on this one, I had all three lots right in a row, and I, I started building the first home and thought I had located one pin. It wasn't the right pin, it was the improper pin. So when I laid out the next two lots, one was dug one day, one was dug two days later then these problems arose. It wasn't like a, an ongoing thing. But back to what you're asking me, a lot of times the builders do their own staking of lots. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the question, I, I bet this has probably been answered at the contractor board, is uh, uh, at some point there would be, I mean, where is our inspector falling on here when, when they inspect the, the um, the uh, floodings or or the lock stake out or what process I mean what how does this happen okay Marcia again as some of you who've been on the council for a while remember we had a discussion with the council probably five six years ago where we wanted to require as part of the ordinance mr. first is referring that they identify the pins and that they show that they're complying and that that would be done by a surveyor to ensure that they were meeting the setbacks However, at that time, there was opposition from the development community, including the home builders, and as such, the council chose not to make those changes. So again, um, and unless there's a surveyor who actually does that and confirms it at the time the uh, foundation forms are being uh, laid in there, there's no confirmation of it until such time as we get to the end of the process and they're having their mortgage survey done. So I think that's what's gonna be talked about again with the contractor's board, and you'll probably hear more discussion about that in the future. Yeah. We're still run. Mr. Bear, I have another question. And uh, uh, as this this particular property uh, is in a drainage easement and a utility or a drainage and utility easement, and my question would be to Marsha is how does that affect this property? Marsha, why don't you talk about the requirements? They have easements, so. drainage easements. Yeah, actually, the requested is before you is a vacation of a portion of the minor drainage and utility easement for that piece of the house that encroaches into it. And we've been re through the review. His engineer has been uh, before the, the staff and has submitted documentation to ensure that there's adequate drainage um, so that we'll not push this onto an adjacent property. And that has been reviewed and documented, and that's the reason for the recommendation that came forward for approval of this. So, yes, it has been evaluated in this case. So, Mr. Mayor, at some point, this, this engineer is willing to take this responsibility on for when that when that property owner comes back to the uh, future city council and says, you guys allowed these people to build this property in this drainage easement. Is that what I'm hearing? For one, the properties. Yes. I, I guess I would ask that to the engineer. Go ahead. Yes, I've already signed, sealed, and stamped those documents. We have demonstrated that the, the easement, if, if this is approved, 
the vacation of a portion of that easement. I have stamped and provided that to staff. It's been reviewed, but yes, my liability is on the line and I accept that liability. I have demonstrated that the easement, once approved, will handle the 100 year event off of both, both adjacent homes. And, and, and that would cover the, the minor drainage easement that this property is placed yes, in? Yes, sir. Yes. I just want to make sure that when someone comes forward and that, that they, okay, thank you. Thank you. Further discussion, let's go to Alderwoman Karen Olson. My question really is for Marsha. Go ahead, please. Um, staff, as I understand, are recommended approval of this item. Is the basis for that approval Mr. Bing's um, engineering um, yes. efforts? That's correct. Thank you. Okay. Motion on the floor is for approval. Discussion on that motion. Let's go to Alderman Aaron Costello. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And we did have a great discussion at Legal and Finance, and I appreciate Joel uh, sort of hitting the highlights of that. Uh, so thank you, Marcia, for the history behind sort of where where we are and, and also highlighting the problem. It was Alderman LaCroix who suggested that something come out of this that, that approaches a solution so we don't have to have city inspectors working extra time, you know, more time than they already don't have to go out and, and for lack of a better phrase, babysit constructors uh, or construction sites. Um, everyone's responsible enough to... Uh, to follow uh, the, the the directions and and comply, uh, it, it's just a question of making sure that that they get the right pins. So, uh, and I th also like to think the part of the point out that part of the issue here is highlighted in the center of the map that we see, where uh, sort of two or three properties down, you can see the lines don't quite line up, and uh, the way I understand it, that's the developers doing. Whereas in in most in most neighborhoods, when they, they design them, they'll set it up so those corner pins line up, so then there's less chance or practically no chance of, of getting the wrong pin because there's one pin for four corners. So I do appreciate uh, Mr. First's efforts in, in taking this to the contractor board, and uh, I'm looking forward to a solution that hopefully does not employ extra uh, man hours by the city of Rapid City. So thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Go to Alderman Lloyd LaCroix. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I just want to thank Ken for uh, bringing light to the subject because, you know, at the meeting, I, I directly asked, how did we catch this? And it was your guys' survey that brought it forward and so forth. And I, and I felt that uh, the Residential Contractor Board does some good work. And since you were on there, just, I felt some good positive things could come from that. And that's why I'd ask that. I think we, uh, and so that's where I'm at with that. And I'd and I'd probably suggest to the council that uh, if we have problems, we've had some discussions with historic preservation along those type things. Maybe we can send quite a bit more to the residential contractors board for recommendations and and their thoughts on what's going on. And because I, I think uh, it'd be very helpful for the council knowing that we do have a committee out there that of contractors that could help us out making our decisions. Thank, Thank you. you. Motion on the floor is for approval. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Mr. Preston, bill list please, or bid I should say. I'm trying to get way ahead of myself, aren't I? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, item number 59 is the Wilderness Play Park project. We received eight bids as listed. Uh, by the way, this is a was continued from the December 21st meeting. We did receive the eight bids as listed. Staff is recommending accepting the bid from Second Nature for the total base bid of 81,200 plus alternate number two, $6,575, and alternate number three, $23,670 for a total of $111,445. We have a motion and a second to award the bid to Second Nature, which is a 
Total base bid of 81200 alternate two for $6,575 and alternate three for $23,670 for a grand total of $111,445. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye, aye. Opposed, motion passes. The uh, next item we have is for uh, high nitrate content hay bales. This is the city has offered these for sale. We received just one bid from Triple T Ranch. Staff is recommending uh, uh, selling the hay bales to Triple T Ranch in the amount of $12,608.40. Mr. Ellis did say he wanted to make a few comments before we place a motion on the floor, if you could. Mr. Ellis. Yes, again, this is uh, selling some surplus hay that we have out at the Water Reclamation Division. We have just over 1,000 bales of hay, which uh, translate into about 302 tons. U.S. Department of Agriculture guidelines suggest that uh, the value of hay of this quality is about $40 a ton. That's what the freeholder set the minimum value at, and the price this translates into from Triple T is $41.75 a ton. So it's a good deal for the city. Very good. Thank you. Can we have a motion? We have a motion and a second to accept the bid from Triple T Ranch for a grand total of $12,608.40. Discussion on that motion? Discussion on that motion. Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, that does take us. We have no items that were added either on the mayor's items or the council items or liaison reports. So that takes us to item number 61. Mr. Ellis, one this is an update one, of our 2012. Yes, I have one short update to give. That is the Civic Center project on December 7th of 2009. A change order in the amount of $15,832 was approved by the city council. And that is the only update I have. Okay. Motion would probably be to acknowledge. So moved. We have a motion second to acknowledge. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item number 62, please. Karen, can you read that in, please? A request by Terry Olson from Lamar Advertising to appeal the denial of an application for a variance to sign code to exceed the height and square footage <coughs> of an off-premise sign to reduce the spacing from off off-premise signs to allow an on-premise sign within 50 feet of an off-premise sign and to allow an overhead service lateral for an off-premise sign per section 15.28.160 of the Rapid City Municipal Co Code on property lo located at, at lot 13 of block 21 West Boulevard section Pennington County, South Dakota. My motion is to uphold the denial. Okay, we have a motion and a second to uphold the denial. Discussion on that motion. Let's go to Alderman Ron Weifenbach. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have, um, I'm not exactly sure which billboard this is. Um, yeah, but if it's right over at those. If you top. actually look right there, you can. Dairy Queen. There's a couple of really ugly ones up there and I'm trying to figure out which one this one is. <laughs> Marsha, can you describe? <laughs> As this map indicates, there's Happy Jacks on the site and the, the Quiznos. It's on the same lot as the Quiznos. Okay. It's not the I mean, really I tall I drive one. that street every day, and, and I mean, maybe two, three, four times a day, and I can't even recall. And I, but I do want to make a couple comments about Lamar advertising and, and their willingness a lot of times to, to you know, work with us on the sign codes and change the signs. And, and uh, there is, a, I'm not sure which ones they own on Mount Rushmore Road, but there's one big, huge, giant one up there that's just atrocious it's a double sign up and down it's, i think it's farther down the street there um is that owned by lamar to terry is it i mean it, mr mayor yep go ahead i would ask terry that question is you're talking about that? the one right by the uh, right by the car wash yeah yes is, is that, that is lamar sign is that lamar sign yes it is lamar would you guys sign. be willing to take that one down if we could <laughs> compromise on this one if you approve this i'll take it down because it's, it's already down oh uh, <laughs> Man, a lot. No, when, let me uh, back up a little bit. You're talking north of the car wash or south of the car wash? That was a big, giant, huge one up there. He's talking about the electronic billboard, uh, I believe, to this north of the car wash. North of the car That's wash. That's the electronic one. That one was okay. 600, 768 square feet. It's now 240 square feet. Okay, and this one you're proposing 360 square feet? 378. 378. You mentioned earlier about 
um, it, the sign code would allow you to just take this big thing down and, and make a nicer, smaller electronic sign. Yes. I, Mr. Mayor, I, um, why don't we just do that? Um, the obstructions, Ron. It, um, um, there's there's on-premise on -premise signs there that would block. If we would drop ours down, theirs would block ours, ours would block theirs. Okay. Have a bigger Competing mess. sign <coughs> deal there. I mean, it, signs, dueling I mean, banjos, if you will. Yeah, and, and not to, I, I think there was a couple missed comments made about your guys' signs and the fact that they're scrolling, flashing, blinking. I, I, I don't think that that's a real issue. I think that some of those scrolling, flashing signs, is, I mean, are, are road hazards or, or, or ours yeah. won't do that. Yeah, I know yours don't do that. I mean, we, I mean, I, you know, you work real hard on trying to do something over there on the west side of town and, and that really accomplished something to help. And I was, I'm not sure if you can work with these people on Mount Rushmore Road to find some kind of a happy medium. Otherwise that sign's going to sit there forever. And I <laughs> understand their frustration, but also on the other, and I understand yours. <clears throat> and it's, it's like, if there was a way that we could do something that was nice, and come to a conclusion and, and uh, sure. but I, I don't think that there's any way I could support a 300 almost 400 square foot electronic sign there I mean that you know so I <coughs> not sure which direction to take that I just wish that was a, we could come with a good compromise like they did with the cold stone so but thank you thank you further discussion motion on the floor is to uphold let's go to Alderman Bill Waugh and then we'll go to Alderman Quaker Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I sit on the Sign Board of Appeals, and I sit through both hearings on this. Um, and we have to remember that the Sign Board of Appeals of, is made up of people from the sign industry. And uh, they voted unanimously at the last meeting at 4 no to uh, deny the appeal. And I would encourage my fellow councilmen to uphold that denial. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go to Alderman. Sam Quaker. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll keep my comments brief. My recollection of this particular billboard is, is that it went up in, what year was it that it went up? 2001. 2001. And it, I was on the planning commission at the time and, and uh, I remember the uh, council was in the beginning phases of discussing a comprehensive sign ordinance. I remember Mayor Munson at the time making the statement that the basket full of permits uh, was growing um, because of the debate over the new sign ordinance process, and this is one of the this is this is one of the the last cows, so to speak, to escape before the barn door was closed, and this is a massive billboard almost a football field in the air. And um, what, we're, what we're hearing here is that there will not be a significant reduction in the space and that one way or another we'll be, uh, we'll be stuck with it. And if Mount Rushmore Road is um, uh, stuck with it, then it should be uh, as is rather than to be a, um, an LED. Thank you. Thank you. Motion on the floor is to uphold the denial. Further discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes and the denial is upheld. Thank you, everyone. We are on to the public hearing items. These are items 63 through 68. 63 through 68. Chair will look for a motion to open the public comment period on. Thank you. We have a motion and second. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We are in the public comment or public hearing uh, time for items 63 through 68. I do not have any speaker request forms. Anyone from the audience wish to speak on any item? 63 through 68 inclusive. Seeing none, we do need to leave uh, the public hearing open. And we are on to the continued public hearing consent items. This is item 63 and 64. Marsha, we good to go on those? Okay. Chair would, Chair would look, anything, Joel? You good? Okay. Chair would look for a motion to approve items, uh, see, the con, uh, continued public hearing consent items, item 63 and 64, per the recommendations in the agenda. We have a motion and a second. Discussion on that motion. Any discussion? 
Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. That does take us to the end of the continued public hearing consent items. Chair, look for a motion to close the public hearing items for items 63 through 68. Thank you. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. We're on to the consent public hearing items. This is item 65 through 67. Marcia, do we need to pull any of these? Okay, how about from anyone else on the dais? If not, Chair would look for a motion to approve the consent public hearing items, item 65 through 67 inclusive, please. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. That does take us to the end of the consent public hearing calendar. We're on to the non-consent public hearing items. This is item number 68. Item 68, second reading ordinance 5568, an ordinance amending section 17.06 of chapter 17 of the Rapid City Municipal Code, rezoning the within described property as requested by Renner and Associates for Rapid City Area School District number 51-4 for a rezoning from flood hazard district to civic center district on property located uh, south of Central High School between North Mount Rushmore Road and West Boulevard North and north of Omaha Street. My motion is for approval with stipulation. Or excuse Sorry. me, just just a, approval. approval. Okay, we have a motion, second for approval. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Op opposed, motion passes. Uh, chair would ask uh, the council's uh, indulgence to reconsider item number four. If we could, please, we need to correct an address. And we have taken that up, so. Move to reconsider item second. number four. Okay, we have a motion and a second to Reconsider item number four. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Item number four, Could let's see. Um, Joel, what do we need to do here? Uh, thank you, Mayor. The address listed is uh, 909 St. Joseph Street. That's actually the address of the bank. The license will be staying at 510 Ninth Street, which is the location of Murphy's. So we just want it to be clear for the publication that the, the location of the license isn't changed. So if the, the council could just uh, recognize that on number four, the license will remain at 510 Ninth Street for the publication, uh, for the public hearing, we would appreciate it. Okay, is that your motion? That would be my motion. Do we have a second? second. We have a motion and second. Any discussion on that motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Thank you everyone for that. Mr. Preston, bill list. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, bill is totals uh, $3,236,360.88. I'm asking the uh, motion maker to make one correction to that, and that's under the South Dakota Municipal Attorneys Association. The 2010 association dues, instead of $35, that should be $140. So that would make a new total of $3,236,465.88. Okay, can we have a motion, please? Okay, how about a second? second? We have a motion and a second. To approve the bill list as amended, new, uh, the amended total of being $3,236,465.88. Any discussion on the motion? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, motion passes. Joel, executive session. Thank you, Mayor. It would be for the purposes authorized in SDCL 125-2. Okay, we have a motion second to go in executive section as permitted by SDCL 1-25-2. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? Motion passes. We're in executive session.